Let's go ahead and turn to chapter 8 of John. Chapter 8 of John, we're going to begin today in verse 21. No, they're not. Excuse me, 12, I lied to you. That's the first one. Only one for today. Chapter, uh, verse 12 of chapter 8 of John. Um, and uh, instead of reading from my uh, iPad, I'm going to read this from the scripture today from the Bible. But pray for me. I didn't bring my readers today, so I'll be like this, trying to make it focus. Um, if you're visiting today, you are catching up in a series, just in the Gospel of John. But over the month of Thanksgiving, what we said we're going to do as a people of God as we prepare for Advent um, and as if you are visiting, you haven't been here in a while, you hear more of our story over the past year. Uh, we want to be in retrospect. That is looking back, not to reminisce about the past, but to see how God has been moving in our lives, preparing us for the new year as a one church family together. And we're going to talk about that more today. And what is God showing us in retrospect as we look back? And what is the message today in this text? And we'll get to that shortly here. I think it'll be very impactful for some of you today. So I've been praying for you this week as God's been working in my heart uh, very hard. And and I'll share with that with you in a little bit too as well. So beginning in chapter 8, the Gospel of John, we're going to pick up in verse 12. And again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, Even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my Father, If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says where I'm going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say to you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And he was, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. This is God's word. May we pray. Father, we are thankful to be in a place this morning, Lord, where we can break away from the focus and the things of this world. As Dave was saying this morning, God, uh, some of us uh, might be in here today and we're wrapped up in the election process. We're wrapped up into the the thoughts of what's going to happen this week, God. And doesn't matter what happens, Lord, the truth is you still reign. That all government and all authorities are under you and your sovereignty, Lord. And we are your people. And we live in direct relationship in this kingdom, God. So let us always be about doing your business, concerned about your things. And as Jesus taught us, let us confess our anxieties to one another. Let us confess our sins to one another so we may be set free and live in this kingdom of light that you brought, Jesus. So right now, come and through your words and through the preaching of your word, God, give us life. Bring us the light of life, Lord. Let not your people leave here in the dark. Let us see clearly, Lord, the truth 
of who your son is so that it may change our identities, God. That we'll leave here different than when we came in, putting our hope and our faith and our trust in you, God. This is only done by you, Father. So please come. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. So when I moved to Georgia a little while ago, it's been over six years now, seven years. Um, it took me two weeks driving around in Georgia, and I couldn't put my finger on it. There was something wrong around here at Georgia. Didn't know quite what it was. I don't think it had anything to do with people speaking in slurred accents. Uh, by the way, I mean, and if I didn't say this at the beginning, I, I, we're coming from South Florida. I grew up in Miami for 18 years and moved to West Palm. I mean, all dead South Florida, right? And it took me a while to kind of put my finger on it. One day we were driving around at nighttime, looking for directions, trying to find some place to go. I actually was trying to find our way back home from coming out to dinner, having the hardest time. And here's what I finally realized. It's dark here. Literally, I don't, if you grew up here, you, you're kind of used to it, right? You drive, and, the, and, and all the time, especially if you're new around here, Anthony, you might have encountered this too, coming from the city life, right? You're driving past the road, go, oh, there it went, right? Because there's no lights on it. You know, it's this big, especially with my eyesight of a mid, my, 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 my vision of a middle-aged man. I can't see things anymore anyways, right? So Heather and I are always fighting about who's going to drive at night, right? So because it's, it's dark here. Now, growing up in South Florida, here's the deal. Let me tell you. I was a kid of the 70s and the 80s. If you lived in the dark, you were in trouble. Because here's the thing that was going on in South Florida. South Florida is a totally different monster than most other cities. If you've ever been to L.A., it's a lot like L.A., right? You have the city, which is a few buildings like this, right? Just in the middle of downtown. And then everything else is what we call sprawl. Sprawl is when developers come in and they just build. And it becomes a concrete jungle of mini malls, homes, and complexes, okay? You can literally start in the middle of downtown Miami. You can drive 30 minutes due west toward the Everglades, and you're still not out of concrete sprawl, all right? This is what it's like growing up there. So here's what would happen. In the 70s and the 80s, with the influx all right, we're, we're, we are now coming out of the, the time of um, racial tensions in America, which are still high right now, but that was happening in Miami. You're coming in with all the island people started moving into Miami, right? All right, Cuba had closed down its border, so now you have illegal immigrants are flooding into this area. Here's what started happening. I'm not blaming this on the race. I'm just making a point here. The darker it is, the more likely you are going to get robbed. Let me say it again. The darker it is, the more likely you're going to get robbed. Matter of fact, it made you feel like, like you would wake up in the morning. Like here, people get robbed more in the daytime than not because this is a bedroom community. You, you work more in the cities, right? You sleep here, you go away to work. That wasn't like where it was where we lived, so people got robbed at nighttime. And why? Because you didn't have your house lit up. And the cops would tell you, well, that's your fault. Put lights on your house. So growing up, my dad, we had a light Light at flagpole, we had lights hanging off the house like this. Matter of fact, it was hard to sleep because you thought it was daylight. And this is what it was living like in South Florida for a while. But here's the thing that we we're learning. If you, if you didn't have lights, the government, the city, was learning that the more crime you were inviting if you kept it in the dark. So a lot of the money went into taxes to pay for street lights, lights on the roads. That's what they were learning. And just, I bring that all up to say this. I don't think we live in a bad place. It's like, unfortunately, we, we don't have the same problems as a big sprawling community like that has. But in much the same way, our spiritual lives are the same way as this, is wherever you find darkness, wherever you find that you've been left alone too long, this is when problems start to happen. Am I right? When things aren't brought into the light like they need to be, it's a confessing church, what we want to be here, this is when things don't can confess and secrets and lies begin to take root and bad things happen in the dark. So as we come into our story today, we are coming into one of the most popular passages of scripture in the Bible is when Jesus declares that he is the light. So as we get going this morning, 
I have one point. It's not a one-point sermon, but this is the main point of the sermon today. If you're a writer, take or note person, you should write down this thing because this is what I want you to think about when you leave today in reference to this scripture passage, okay? I'm not going to repeat it a lot, but this is what it all wraps around. Here's the main point of the day is this. Jesus identifies himself as what, guys? The light. So Jesus identifies himself in which he identifies the religious. You're about to see this in scripture today. Shedding light on the identity we need. See, I had to use that word three times. I had to, I was worked hard at that, right? Jesus identifies himself in which he identifies the religious. That's what we're talking about today. Shedding the light on the identity we need. And this is the basis of all that, is light is needed for identification purposes. So let's kind of jump right into our text this morning. I want to get rolling with this. So, so first we're going to talk about, well, what is this gospel that Jesus is bringing us? What is this light all about? So point one, well, what is this light? Jesus is identifying himself as the light. Look again at verse 12. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Big words, right? Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, in the gospel of John, this is the big revelation right? This is one of the great I am statements, but John has set this up for us. This is like when you watch a movie and you don't know the plot yet or who's doing the bad things or who's doing the good things and it all becomes revealed. You ever watch that movie, The Usual Suspects? Anybody ever watch that? No, but I am dating myself. You got to watch it. It's a crime drama, right? But you don't know who the bad guy is to the last five minutes of the movie, right? And it'll, bam! You're like, what is that? That's what John's doing, okay? So here's where he sets it up, though. He's prepared us to hear this statement. See, when John wrote the Gospel of John, it wasn't like he was writing a chapter a year. He wrote it one shot. Well, let's go back to the beginning of the story. John wanted us to be ready for this moment, right? Watch this. In verse 4 of chapter 1, he says, In him was life, and the life was the what? The light of men. John's setting us up. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That word here is, there's a war going on. It didn't understand him. It couldn't subdue him. It couldn't comprehend him. The darkness could not conquer Christ. And the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Verse 9, 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. It did not know the light. John has set us up for this moment. So whenever you read the text, here's a small point today. Whenever you see things, you go, hey, I remember reading that before somewhere in this book. There's a purpose in that. John wants you to focus in right now. So please, let's all focus in, right? So first, let's talk about what is this light? Why do we need to know about this? Why should we even care? So let's give a little Bible background about light. The first time we see light in Scripture, Genesis 1-3, right? And the first day of what? Creation. The first thing that God created was what? Light, right? Right? And the light shone in the darkness, and God called it good. And God then used light to do this. Everything that God created from that moment on, the light was there to identify it. And what did it identify it as? Good. Light shows what is good. That's a scriptural theme. That's why John's using it here. Light is to identify what is good. What is what God has done is good. The second place you kind of see in Exodus, the people were led out of Egypt in Exodus 13. By, by a pillar of smoke in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. So what's light providing? It's providing direction for God's people. It's providing protection for God's people. Matter of fact, it separated what the Egyptians from the Israelites when they were about to move across the Dead Sea. So it offers light and protection and guidance. The psalmist in 27.1 actually says, Now the Lord is my light. I'm going to keep going real quick here. There's also been prophesied in Isaiah 49 that the light would be the light for all nations, not just for the Jewish people as it starts to unravel here. The prophecies are becoming known, but like for all men. And eventually, and here's the beauty of the light, guys. Eventually, God is the light for all his people. It says in Isaiah 60, which is a repeat of Revelation 22.5. Can I I just take a second and read that to you? It's beautiful. You mind? If you said yes, you're, you're, you're in trouble. All right, let me read this to you. Again, forgive me, I don't have my glasses. Isaiah 60. 
the beauty of what God will be for his people. Beginning in 19. And this is the same thing it says it in Revelation 22. It says, The sun shall be no more, your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. God's light for his people means that which you are afraid of in the dark, you no longer have to be afraid. In the end, when God is our light and our only source of light, there's no more reason for fear. There's no more reason to hide things. God knows all. This is the promise that we're told in Revelation 22. It's coming for his people. So it's great to have light and rejoice in it. So let's talk a little bit about the opposite of light. What is darkness? Matt Chandler preached a sermon on the, about Jesus being the light, and he uh, was talking with one of his, his daughters, and he defined it like this. He said, he said, secrets are the darkness in which death and destruction grow. I want to add a word in there. Are you ready? Secrets and lies are the darkness in which death and destruction grow. Darkness in the scripture means things that are against God, the enemies of God. The biggest enemy that God ever had lied about himself and was cast out of heaven. It was his lies. I don't know what it was like in those days, but he kept secret things from God or tried to, and God knew who it was, knew what he was doing. And for us as God's people, it's always been the same thing. Darkness represents for us the secrets that we try to keep from each other and the lies that we tell ourselves and other people so we're not found out. I just kind of want to open this up for a minute here. What kind of things are the secret and the lies that we keep here as God's people? And, and if you're visiting today, you might not be a Christian. This, this message is more for Christian people. There's all elements of the gospel. You will hear it today, but you're going to hear a lot about the church in it today. But think about that for a minute. The secrets that we have a hard problem with. Um, I think about things like this. I, I, I think about, because I've heard this story a lot. Uh, I've talked with people about this story. I think things because of social media, Facebook, especially with whether it's men or with women, things like this, little secrets like you're not happy with your relationship at home, so what you do is you begin to contact the old ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend. That's a secret, isn't it, right? But you know what happens with religious people? We don't share that stuff, do we? The religious kind of starts, now I can't do that because why? We're fearful of being convicted or fearful of being cast out, fearful of being condemned. And a lot of times we fear that. You know why? Because we would do the same things, aren't we? Guys, some of us, you know, things like you're spending a little too much money on the weekend fantasy football betting. It's cutting into your tithe money. It's cutting into your grocery shopping money. It's cutting into your wife's salary, Right? Things like that. Think about that. Little secret things that we keep in the dark that keep us from confessing because we're afraid of what others may think about us because really we're kind of the same way. We judge harshly, don't we, as a people, if we admit it. We judge harsh. Those are the secrets in the dark type of things. So how do we come to the light if we're afraid to? How do we actually get there? As I said, light identifies its own drawing, the people of light, it becomes like this moth to the flame syndrome. The more intense the light is, people actually begin to let go of secrets and let go of lies, and they begin to come to the light. And Jesus' claim here, so, in saying this, has to be taken very seriously, doesn't it? Following me is not a way of life, as he was saying in the scripture, for people. He's saying that it is the light of life, and Jesus is saying for all exclusively. Jesus is not saying the way of life for some people, if you want it, is to follow me and I'll give you a light. He is saying, I was created, you were created in light, right? My light in the beginning, and I am your source of light now. All must come to the light if you're going to have life. This is an exclusive claim. This is why many religions don't even count when you have arguments with them anymore. There is one person that says, I am the way. Jesus says, I am the light. There is no other light. Very hard thing to take, but we've got to accept this. There's not another way for us to judge what is right and what is wrong outside of what he lived and preached. Jesus, in identifying himself, though, 
and this light automatically, though he begins to identify others. Hey, look, man, when Jesus shows up in your life, he just begins to very starkly, doesn't he, in our lives, begin to tell us who we are. Just by reading the word sometimes, doesn't it? I'll tell you about something that happened to me this week in, in a little bit. So we have reactions to the light as Jesus identifies us and where we are as we get to this. In the text, picking up verse 14, just two things. I'm not going to read the whole text because I don't want to cut us long on time here. In verse 14, he says what? You do not know me or where I come from or where I'm going. In 15, and you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Two things that kind of become a problem here. Jesus is saying you can't perceive God rightly when you're in the dark because you are judging by the flesh. When you're caught in the dark, let me, let me just explain this in theological terms here. Everybody should know, we've preached this enough here, when you're born, are you born good? No, you're born evil. You're born in the dark, right? Therefore, Jesus says you can't perceive him rightly because you're judging by the flesh, which you do not know. We don't have a shot unless Jesus comes after us, folks. This is the truth, right? This is why we've got to practice confession. This is why we've got to practice repentance as a people. We've got to go after this. And here's what's happening to the guys in the text. I want to share this with you. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 kind of shed some more light on this this morning. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, you can't really see it, right? It's kind of hidden. It's veiled to those who are perishing, that's dying. And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the, what? Light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The gospel is veiled to these guys in our story. So here's a good truth I want to teach us here. Don't have to write it down. Just kind of remember this is this. These guys were Pharisees. They were about living by righteous means. By the way, guys, you're in class tonight. Remind me to pick up on something that I'm going to share with you, a little extra something special tonight about this text. They were, they were living by the law. That's what they were interested in. But here's the good truth that we can learn from this is good intentions, listen to me, good intentions do not bring you into the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. Good intentions do not bring you into God's kingdom. Your work at behaviors and rule following can't make you see Jesus for who he is, can they? What's in happening in the story? These guys were righteous dudes. They were following the law. Could they see him for who he was? They were blind. Does that sound like any of us in here this morning? It's dangerous, isn't it? It's dangerous to think that you're right. The light is identifying that there could be lost people in the church. That's what's happening. This was the church back then, guys. And the light was coming to the world, and it did not know him. This is the, the word I'm going to use for it. The people here today is the religious. The religious. As Tim Keller would say, there's two types of confession that every Christian has to go through. Remember what those are? Confession of sin, confession of religion. We've got to go through both of them as Christians. The religious people in Scripture, and I think I'm going to expand this out a little bit, and in church or this. Religious people follow codes of conduct. You might be this person. You might have grown up with this person. You might have been in a church that was like this. I was in a church like this. It says that if you follow the, road, the code of conduct, you're okay. That means if you went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday evening, plus dinner on Wednesday evening, you stayed for choir practice, you went to your prayer meetings on Wednesday, you read your Bible at least during the weekdays. Maybe on weekends you could take off, right? You said your prayers before every meal, and you said some prayers in the day that you were okay. Religious people follow a code of conduct thinking that makes them okay with God. These guys in the scripture, guess what they were doing all the time? Reading their Bibles and praying and discipling other people to be just like them. Code of conducts don't get you into God's kingdom, Jesus is pointing out. Religious people love to show others when they're wrong. Religious people love to condemn others. They love to attack others for what they believe. And here's a big one, they don't like to say sorry. Well, you made me do that. Well, it's the truth. They don't like to say sorry about things. And religious people like to show their way, and they like to sound smart. They like to boast about their way. Now, they might not do it verbally. They might show you how their life works out in front of you. 
by like if, I don't know, maybe if they, they talk about their tithing and how much they have because of their tithing. That's a religious way of looking at things, right? And they also like, to, a lot of times, they like to have followers because it makes them feel better. If they have people that follow them or if they've got a group of friends that believe the same way they do, that tells the religious person, hey, what I'm doing is right. It gives them credibility. Are you all seeing that this morning? So maybe you've been a religious person in your past. I know I've been. Here's the other thing. I struggle with this all the time. Anybody else there in the same boat as I am? I mean, seriously, guys. Here's, let me share the story of what happened to me this week. As, as I told, I started this little mini-series in retrospect a couple weeks ago, confessing to you that I've been spiritually thirsty, right? And I was like in a dark place for a while. And you guys didn't even know it. I didn't even know it, right? Because Jesus had to show it to me, right? When you're, you're sometimes in the dark, you don't know it unless he comes to show it, shows it to you. But what happened this week, and I was sharing with Pastor Bill, is going through life certain patterns, Christians, and as you grow in God, this should happen to everybody in here. You're, you're going along through life, and, and, and you notice things in your life that you don't like, right? It could be patterns of your thought processes. Are you thinking of people in, in appropriate ways, whether it's sexually or as objects? Are you thinking of money as objects and things that you can acquire, right? You know, I'm not to list it all out, but you find yourself in that, and you know, you know, you know, you know, but Lord, I know that I'm saved. I know I've experienced the gospel. I've rejoiced in what you've done for me. I'm co- I've confessed the sin. I'm trying to move on, right? And there's this thing, like you go, but why am I still thinking like that? Have you, anybody, everybody else ever experienced that before? You go, well, why is my mind still bring up these thoughts? Why don't I love myself like I should, right? Why, why, why is it so hard to live with myself and sometimes look in the mirror? because of what I'm thinking about while I'm lying in bed. Has anyone ever experienced that? And here's what happens in the midst of all that. Is, it's just like the song we were singing. Goodness is like a fetter. Like, tie your goodness around my ankle, Lord, like a chain, so that I don't go wandering off. Right? That's what that song is picturing. So you know what happened this morning? I'm listening to music. I've read my Bible. All of a sudden, I find myself on the floor wailing out to God for who I am and where my heart has been. Not because I did a sin, but God was showing me, you need me still, don't you? Yes, Lord, I need you. And see, that's Christian confession. It happens naturally. It's not because I went and acted against somebody. It's because God is constantly showing me through his word and through the act of confession, you need me, Jody. Yes, Lord, bind your goodness around me. So as Christians, here's what I'm saying to all of us in this room. We need to be people like this and practicing this. Every once in a while, mine seems to be weekly. I don't know what's wrong with me. I think it's just I'm, I'm having hormonal changes. Um, it, it, it's, it's like you should find yourself crying before God, not because you did something so wrong, just because God is showing you what you need to confess. Does that make sense? Is it, am I the only one who does this? Okay, right? And you just, it, but that's a good sign. That's living as a Christian. That's believing in God that he's saving you and is saving you and will save you. There should never be a time in our life where we're not at some point going, oh, Lord, it's still like that. Confess it and turn from it and keep going. That's our Christian life. And that's, I'm afraid of the most, if we don't do that, but we become religious people, right? We get stuck in code of conducts instead of being freed by the gospel continually. We've got to keep going back to that. So Jesus identifies himself and as the one who judges the right way of life, not the religious people. He does the judging, he says. And he has shed some light on this, I wonder, for you yet this morning, as I've just asked you. So there's two things we can do here, and and this is not the, like, how do we respond to the gospel? This is just things I was putting in here because I'm going, well, how how do we need to start handling this? Because this isn't the hope of, all the hope of the gospel, but just a different way. I want to offer you a different way of thinking about this. Here's the first one I think that we can do here. Is one, I want us to do this. I think as a church, we need to stop judging ourselves against other people in the church. Okay? Don't look at me and go, well, Jody does this, I should be doing this. Or don't look at yourself going, why isn't that person behaving like me? We need to stop that. Who is the only one that we should be judging ourselves by? It's Jesus. That's what he just said, right? He's there. The light is there to identify you, not other people. We have to stop that, right? Jesus said in 16, my judgment is true. For it's I alone who judge. 
It's not I alone judge, but the Father who sent me. Secondly, I think we have to do this. I think we got to come to Scripture. That's Jesus with the expectation of being discovered. When you read the Bible, I've said this many times, this will be one of our things that we're going to pound on the, on the podium. We don't have a podium, we have a bandstand. Constantly, right, is this. When you read the Bible, do you read it to get answers for life or do you read it to get Jesus? Who do we, what do we read it for? We get to get Jesus, right? To get Christ, that we want to see Jesus coming out of the text. But here's the thing. When you read it to get Jesus, be prepared to be found out what you're hiding. So is it going to make you happy all the time when you read the Bible? No, but that's normal. Jose was talking about that last week. There's a shame that leads you to repentance and confession, isn't it? Right? That's normal. Be prepared to be found out when you read Scripture. Anticipate it. Pray that. Jesus, I need to be found out what is hiding in here. Show it to me so I may confess it, Lord. So this brings us to, now we've seen who is Jesus in the gospel. What's the gospel doing for us? It's identifying us. And how is the gospel working for us right now? So it brings us to three, the workings of the light. Jesus' grace for us. There is so much grace in what the light does for us. Now, if your parents, remember that old saying, as your parents told you growing up when they had to spank you, this is going to hurt me more than does you? Right, that? How many of y'all believe that? Not many of us, right? But Jesus loves us enough that his discipline is tender. It's kind. It's meant to bring you back to him. So let us learn about this right now. So the workings of the light, Jesus' grace for us. The light keeps speaking, and it speaks more. It speaks for more than just himself. Jesus says in verse 26 of our text today, he says, I have much to say. He's declaring now. He's giving good news about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I've heard from him. So, so now we see there's a message, not just from Christ, but it's from our Father God. He is bringing a message that we cannot hear because we've been in the dark. Jesus has brought the message into the world to hear from our, from our Father, that person that we've been estranged from. That could, and he's the only one that can help us see the light. So in verse 28, Jesus said to them, here's how you're going to see it. Unless you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me to speak. At last, the light has revealed the huge truth. There's revelation now. This is what's going on. There's a plan here. The Father had a plan in sending Christ. The Father had a plan and hiding and veiling this gospel from the people at that time. There's scandalous grace going on here. To defeat the darkness, to defeat the lies, to defeat the secrecy that we live in. The Father uses glory-seeking religious people to believe that by killing Jesus, which they would, that they would extinguish his light and let them live in their own co conduct and let them build glory for themselves. But in that, the attempt at light extinguishing, it actually made the gospel explode, didn't it? The plan was, was to let his own people kill his son. Try to put the light out. And instead of putting water on a light, they put gas on a fire, didn't they? So what happens instead of being extinguished, it's actually getting brighter all the time. And, and, and it's the only thing this hot little fire is the only thing that can bring religious people out of where we are. Here's what's happening. And this, this fire burns brighter all the time. If you think about when it started to now, how many people have followed Christ? And every time you have another person follows Christ, is throwing another log on the fire. This type of light can never go out. This kind of light is self-reproducing now. It can't be extinguished. But here's what happens. If you've ever been outside when it's really cold outside and you light a fire outside, what do you hear going on around that fire? You hear suction. It's drawing in oxygen, producing heat. Here's how the religious people of our day are saved. This is why the church is important. This is why we need to be confessional, relational with one another. This is why we need to repent sin. It's because of this. It's only that when we get sucked into a fire, a holy fire produced by the, by the Holy Spirit, is the only way that we'll ever come clean. See, if you have a dead church and nothing happens and no one ever confesses, everything stays secret. 
and code of conduct never gets broken. But if you've got a fire that starts boiling, people get sucked in it and you become fuel for the fire. And the more fuel that's added on the fire, the more confession and repentance begins to happen. You all seeing that? Can someone say amen? I think you all did this morning, right? That's how religious people are saved is when it bursts out in their midst. So what's the light been doing for our church in retrospect? I want to talk about this for a second before we, we wrap up. I think this. As Jesus has been declaring us to the word of what we've been learning, as we've been learning in the Gospel of John about who Christ is, and as we came up on this little section here about, in retrospect, how do we look back so that we can move forward in faith? Here's what I think we've seen last year. Let me speak to each one of you, and let me slow this down a little bit. Okay, you ready? And if you're visiting the room or you've not been in here long, let me teach you a little church history over the last year. We were two churches that we joined as one last, I'm going to say last December. That's really when we started meeting together. And so what happened over the last year, we wrote out all these goals. Well, we want to have this many missional communities living in the community. We want to have this, little, this much DNA groups and people meeting together. And we want to get our, build up our children ministries to be like this. And we want to build up our, our, our liturgy team so what the Sundays happen like this. And here's what has happened for every one of those goals happen. You know what, what happened? Jesus said, no, 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 no. Go live as a people for a while. And Jesus began this process. He sent us out in the desert with nothing, except one thing, his light. And what has he done for that one light? He's protected us, and he's guided us to this moment. But do you know what happens when Jesus does things like that? This is called grace. Because you know what would have happened if we would have came in together as a body, and ministries would have started producing and flying off? All of a sudden, we got 20 missional communities. Everybody who was like up for missional communities, I told you my way was right. I told you this is how we should do things. If DNA would have taken off, I told you we should have been doing this. Right? Or if we had 400 people coming on a Sunday morning, I told you we need to pay more attention to this. And then what happens when Jesus is birthing a church? It begins to get lost in ministry idols. And people begin to hide in the little corners of ministry idols because if I'm right, you don't have to know about me. And I can judge you because you're not like me. Do you see that? So what's been happening this year, it's been grace. Nothing but grace, guys, that nothing is taken off like it's supposed to or like we think it. But we can't see where God is waiting for us down the road, can we? This church will look totally different than we've ever thought it would be. I'm okay with that, are you? Right? So let's turn the page on that, folks, and thank God for releasing us from these idols. So again, I want to ask you, are you finding that spot where you need to confess of your religion? It brings us to the way that we respond to the light now. It's the last part. See, God always works this way in Scripture. Guys, Messiah, you'll recognize this one. First, he reveals. Then he blesses, right? And then what's he do? He sends you, right? So now as the gospel's working on us, is giving us grace, there is a calling upon us as a people of God. How do we respond to the light? Verse 30 Here's, how, well, here's what happened to people who were around him at that moment. And as he was saying these things, many what? They believed in him. As Dave Richards was pointing out a few weeks ago, they believed into Jesus. Like they were trusting what he was saying was right. So is that you this morning? Are you believing into Jesus? Do you see that he's saving us from being just another real church, religious churchgoer? Coming into light means... Things like this, confessing our sins to one another. It means repentance once we confess to turn from those things. It means following Jesus. It means discipling one another in how to follow Jesus. It means that your slate's been wiped clean and now people can actually see light through you. I want to give you one of the glorious things of Scripture here. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says this, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The calling of Christ in our lives, my family, is to share with what he's given you. That's light. That's the calling that Jesus is putting on us. So in this instance, in this moment in time, here's what Jesus is asking of us. To begin to share where have we been hiding in the dark corners, not stepping fully into light. 
so that Jesus can tell others how he loves them, and we begin to confess this to one another. See how the Lord's been working in your life? See how he's been working in my life? And we all begin to grow in faith because we see how Jesus has been working in each other. This is how unity in the church begins. It begins with confession. And light pours out of you because you know why? You were made to be a mirror to reflect the light of Christ into others' lives. We're reflecting his image now. Let me give you, if, if church, if we really kind of stepped into this, and, and please understand me. Again, I told you, I'm, I get into like Coach Jody sometimes. I love you all. I get mad at myself more than anything, right? I'm expressing joy right now. If we were to become a church that would confess our dark corners we hide in, here's what happens. Here's what it begins to look like. We'll see less of this. Religious people will always pursue others to tell them what's wrong, but redeemed people will be pursued by others to find out what, how their life is working. How does that work for you? I just saw you, someone get mad at you and you forgave them. Someone didn't pay you back and you, you said you gave them more. How does that work? And people will pursue, redeem people to find out the secrets to life. This is, could be us. Religious people get tired and frustrated by the world, but redeemed people will strangely find joy from sufferings that associate them with Christ. You've got a long next four years, whoever's president, guys. Are you going to do it with a smile on your face or scowling every day? People want to run to that person who's found joy. Reflect Christ. Reflect him. Religious people point to the way that they've developed and how they should live life. Redeemed people point only to one thing, the cross. There is my salvation, and I know that I'm loved. And you can have the same thing. And religious people seek to glorify themselves by their accomplishments and their acquaintances. And look who's following me. Where I would deem people, they only point to the only person they wish to impress, which is Jesus. It's who they can talk about. Let us be a church of redeemed people, not religious people. So in retrospect, as we, that's been kind of the theme here, guys. I want us to do this. I want us to keep asking ourselves and confess to one another where we've gotten kind of lost in the dark. And it doesn't mean it's like some deep, dark sin. Like in my house, we only have windows. It's kind of weird, newer homes. You only have windows, have you noticed, on the front and the back. You very rarely have them on the sides, right? Florida, you have windows on every side because it's so hot, right? I had a house that was built in the 30s in Miami. It, when, the whole thing was windows, right? So you get natural light all the time. In my house, I noticed the other day, light was coming in the front dining room windows, and you know what to create it? There's this big dark corner because light only comes in one way. And as I was seeing, I was thinking, we got to be a people who we're kind of towing in the light a little bit. We kind of like it, but there's this dark thing that we don't want to give up. And sometimes if you like that dark thing, you'll, you'll really scooch in a corner and you don't want to be known. The light is calling us to do this. It's calling us to confess it and to let other people see it. I want us to be a church where this is not strange. This is common. This is ongoing. This is so that we can reflect the light of Christ in others' lives. So in retrospect, I want you to ask about those dark corners. Ask the Lord to show them to you. If he drives you to the floor in tears, call me. I'll come cry with you. I'm serious about that. And we'll love on each other. And what dark corners do you like to hide in? And where are you fearing and losing? What are you fearing and losing step into the light? So I want to leave you with this, guys. If you're despairing today... This, this message is not meant for you to despair. It's meant for you to have hope. Religious people are only saved when they see the light of Christ. Okay? So here's the good news. If you're feeling conviction over these things, let, let, me, let me proclaim the gospel to you. In Philippians 3, 20 and 21, it reads like this. It says this, But our citizenship is in where? Heaven. Guys, you're a United States American citizen, second. You're a citizen of heaven, number one. That is your allegiance. Listen, and from it, we await a Savior who's coming back for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is who you are you are part of the light. You're not a part of the kingdom of darkness. Your conviction 
If you're feeling it this morning, if God has tugged on you somewhere about a code of ethics you think is what, how you get saved, is Jesus subjecting you to his will? He's saying, let me identify you first, just like he did to the Pharisees. You don't know where I come from and you don't know what I'm about. He cares too much about you to leave you in the dark, family. He's bringing you into his light. So here's my request of you today. Let him love you today. Step into the light. Begin to confess to him and your family where you've been hiding in all this time. Let people know. Jesus is the light, and he's given you a new identity, folks. You know what that is? You're the reflection of his glory. You reflect the glory of Christ. You are light bearers, my family. That's who you are. You're not the darkness. Don't be in it. Come join your family. And believe in what he's going and doing into you, O citizen of heaven today. Amen. Let us pray.